All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks. On Tuesday, the 27th day of September, and uh, it is Year of Our Lord 2011. Welcome to the John Moore Show. Well, gentlemen, um, the things that concern all of us, these earth changes, uh, earthquakes and so forth, continue to uh, spin wildly out of control. Uh, the Canary Islands are doing some very uh, serious things. I don't know if either one of you have been paying attention, but there's been, I believe, about 6,000 earthquakes there in the past few months, uh, more than 400 the past 48 hours, uh, all of which are precursors to either a major earthquake or a volcano eruption. And the volcanic eruption appears to be uh, looming, according to the geologist, which means uh, the possibility of the east coast of the United States, uh, North America, being wiped out by a tidal wave, which has happened in the past from the same source, by the way. All of which uh, leads me to uh, uh, encourage people to become independent uh, with their electrical needs and, of course, be away from these oceans. But um, And that's where Zapworks comes in, is for people to take charge of their own electrical needs and be independent of the power grid so they can have refrigeration and lights and uh, keep uh, medical equipment running if they need to and uh, quite frankly maybe maybe save some lives in your neighborhood if necessary uh, so gentlemen that's what we'll be talking about today as always is how people can become energy independent truly energy independent not this make-believe fantasy stuff that mainstream media puts out we're visiting this morning with mr. Steve Ellis mr. Hank Munzer with Zapworks go to my home page TheLibertyMan.com. Scroll down to the yellow starburst and and click on there. You'll be at their homepage pretty quick. Well, gentlemen, we we've been hearing for years about going green, uh, about the benefits of making electricity from wind power, uh, sunlight, and so forth. Uh, the missing link that won't be talked about in mainstream media. The missing link is how do you store the energy? Uh, what they advocate in, in the mainstream media and these mainstream companies is people buy golf cart batteries, forklift batteries um, that are very expensive uh, and may on a really uh, possibly last for 12 years, maybe. And people could easily spend twenty to thirty thousand dollars on forklift batteries to run their home, easily do that, and uh, have them become scrap metal in seven to twelve years possibly a lot sooner if they're not properly maintained or if they get a uh, deep cycle discharged uh, one time too many which actually one time would be enough wouldn't it hank <laughs> it would i mean um, i don't think people realize that when they run a battery dead how quickly that'll uh, that'll destroy it and right. uh, they don't. it's easy to happen you know this knowledge that you have hank and steve and the, and the products that you bring to the table have become lost in the dust of time. I've talked about this before, but it needs to be mentioned that when you have respected professors of electrical engineering at, at highly regarded engineering schools like the University of Missouri at Rolla, Science and Technology, when even they don't know about the existence of nickel, iron, alkaline batteries, we know that uh, this technology has been pretty thoroughly lost in the dust of time and what you bring to the table is dusting it off, polishing it up, and having it ready to go just as good and nice as it was in 1904 when Thomas Edison was uh, marketing these nickel iron alkaline batteries for the first time. Um, and you, truly, truly, gentlemen, what you bring to the table is genuine, bona fide uh, electrical independence, not this make believe, feel good stuff that the mainstream media promotes. And for that, I applaud you, and that's what we're going to educate people about this morning, is how they can truly become energy, energy dependent long term um, and, and uh, have something that's reliable and cost effective. So, Hank, could you give us a quick explanation of what a nickel iron battery is and, and why it is superior to the lead acid batteries that we've all been used to for so many years? Okay, let me uh, basically back up, because originally when the batteries were first invented, um, they were invented by a gentleman over in Europe, and he made the nickel-cadmium. And anyone's familiar with nickel-cadmium batteries, um, when he first created them, he used a, a nickel and an iron substrate. 
a combination, but he never did patent the nickel iron. That's what Edison did. So Edison necessarily didn't invent. He just basically took someone else's technology and pursued it and uh, basically perfected the technology. But the difference is, is uh, cadmium is capable of holding in cold weathers, but the problem is it has memory. Anyone who has you know, a battery charger that has one of those nickel metal hydrides or, or uh, NICAD batteries in their units, uh, drills or whatever, they'll find that they end up going bad, and then if you charge them a few times, and they won't take a charge over time. And they usually, you know, they're, they're usually no good in two or three years. Well, nickel iron doesn't have that influence. It's an alkaline battery, and it's in the same category as most people refer to, but the nickel iron itself, you can charge it, discharge it, no memory, and, uh, and as long as the electrolyte's never exposed to air because you put a mineral at the top, it'll never go bad. A hundred years from now, you'll still be using it. And then what we bring to the table is different than any other battery manufacturer, is that when we rate our batteries, we rate them from the time that they're fully charged to the time they go down to 10 volts. Even Edison, when he manufactured them, he would rate a battery at 500 amp hours. And the same battery that we would have would be three times bigger to get the same amount of power because he, he actually rated them as an individual cell. When you hook them in a string, you actually lose a certain amount of your power. And the other thing is he rated them from the time they were fully charged to the time they were dead which is not usable power. When we rate ours, we, we do it from the time they're charged to the time that if it's a 12-volt system, it hits 10 volts. If it's a 48-volt, it hits 40 volts. That's the time when your inverter would want to shut off. Right. And that's what's usable power. And that's what's different about our company than any other company is when we rate them, that's what you're actually getting. And the nice part is, is the battery is capable of doing more than that. After about six months of time, it actually increases 30%. Really? So, so you end up getting more power than what the rating shows. So that's what that's we a, did different. That's amazing. Well, and, and that's that's really good to know. You know. Well, a lot of people, especially uh, healthy young men and health, healthy young women, they may think, well, I can live without electricity. Well, yes, you can. Uh, however, and here comes a however, what about baby formula? What about refrigeration for baby formula? Refrigeration for medications? Uh, people who need medical devices that run on electricity to stay alive. So while you may be able to survive yourself without electricity, uh, there may be others in your family or close by neighbors or friends or relatives that uh, electricity is not an option, plus your communications equipment. Uh, I don't know of any radio that will run without electricity. <laughs> that, that device doesn't exist that I'm aware of. What I'd like to see people do is just basically try going without electricity for three weeks. See how well that well, works for them. <laughs> well, I, I came close to that. It was two weeks. We had a, a massive ice storm, three inches of sheet of ice here. But it would be three years ago this winter coming up. Um, and I, I went without electricity for about uh, ten days. My wife was out of town, so she didn't have to experience that. It was... Um, the first uh, two to three days was a challenge, and by the third day, I developed a routine that, that was okay for me. Um, but I, I didn't have the issues that I mentioned where I, had, I didn't have any medications that needed to be refrigerated, no, med no medical equipment that needed to keep running. Um, I have batteries charged up for my radios already so that they were lasting me okay. So it, it's not easy. And uh, if you've got... Uh, infants or really old people or uh, anything that requires these matters I was talking about, uh, you'll find an uh, extreme challenge trying to get by for three weeks without electricity. Have you done that yourself, Hank? I've been without electricity before. It's not, not easy. I mean, it's a, a real inconvenience. I mean, I can do it, but a lot of people just don't have the stamina. And you got a whole family, and I mean, I laugh because we have a lot of people that are real survivalist-minded, and they go out and buy you know, flour grinders and everything else to do it by hand. And I said, you know what, have you ever tried cooking with that? And have you ever actually tried grinding enough to make, you know, bread? These guys have never really done it before, you know, and they just don't know what they're in for. Some no. people can, and it is possible to do, but the average person isn't. Anyone I know that actually does that has to hook it up to a bicycle and pedal it because it's too hard to do by hand. You know? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> but, he's, he, he, well, you're right. He's inexpensive when I say uh, less than $100. Uh, grain grinders that run by hand are incredibly labor intensive. You know, you get something a, a larger, maybe a three hundred dollar grain grinder that's got a really big wheel on the side of it. Then you're cooking with something that wouldn't take quite so much effort. But uh, it is incredibly labor intensive to grind grain by hand. Uh, and many things, uh, a washing machine, for example, 
people our age, people under the age of, of 70 or so, most of them don't know what it was like doing laundry without electricity. Um, but it was one full day a week in these homes and you know, all over the country just to do laundry. One full day a week, typically it'd be Mondays, and that tradition still carries over in a lot of families. It was done for so many decades. Uh, doing laundry by hand is another incredibly labor-intensive experience uh, that is, electricity it, makes go away. And it wouldn't be so bad, you know, if it was just one thing you have to do, but if power goes out and we get into a crisis situation, not only are you having to grind your own wheat, not only are you going to have to wash your own clothes with the scrub board, I mean, on and on the list goes. You don't have any time. I don't think people well, realize how much is put on their plate. Yes. We're talking about electricity and how having electricity is not a luxury. It is a necessity to keep people alive, to pump the water, to keep medications refrigerated, baby formula refrigerated, medical equipment going. And um, this is the way you do it. You put together a system. And uh, the first thing you do is call Steve Ellis. And uh, Steve, what is your telephone number for people to call you? Area code 406 And uh, when they make this call, the only assumption you have, uh, Steve, is that these people know little or nothing about electricity. And you're not judgmental. You just take that assumption and run with it, don't you? That's right. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm mostly interested in what people are using in their homes. Their consumption, and, and they need their electric bill. Yeah, so they can dig out their electric bill. Uh, several bills would be good. A year's worth would be excellent because then we can get a, a one-year average. Um, and uh, then we can, we look at what's something called kilowatt hours, don't we? Yep. And uh, what goes, what happens next there, Steve? Well, we discussed um, basically what you'll need for setting up a system to start. And, but everything starts from the kilowatt hours. Right, and, and right. So that, just uh, come give me a call, and then we can discuss it, and you can find out where, where what, what you need to get going. And a system consists of the following components. First of all, a way to make electricity, and there's multiple ways, uh, a propane fire generator, wind power, solar power, water power, steam power. Um, a way to store electricity, which is the Zapworks batteries, and a way to distribute it, which is the inverter that converts it from DC to AC. Of course, a person could set up a house to run on both, couldn't they, Hank? Well, they can. And when you're setting up a system, a person has to decide, and here's the way we approach things. We don't do things like most people do in the solar business. I get guys in all the time. We'll sell someone a package, $15,000. They say it's going to take care of them, and it's not even close. It's not even half as big as what they need. The nice part about these nickel iron batteries, I mean, this in the business in general, the most important part was to make sure the battery sizing was big enough. And because uh, if you didn't and you undersize your batteries, not even shorten the life of your batteries, but you could theoretically destroy them in just less than four to six months, maybe even a year. And that's a huge investment. People get pretty oh, yeah. upset with that. Um, I took all by by putting these nickel iron batteries out there. We took away that possibility or that problem. So if, even if they're undersized or someone runs them dead, they're not going to hurt them. So before sizing the, the battery system, you know, hasn't become as important. You know, and the question is, is now is how much power do you need? And uh, obviously you put too small a battery pack in there, you're just going to cycle your generator three or four times a day or, or once a day, depending on the size of the battery pack. Or if you have enough or don't have enough wind and solar, you have to back it up. So uh, those are the trade-offs, but the nice part is, is you're never going to damage anything, and you can always add to it. Or if you have a, you know, a lead-acid battery system, that's it's not so easy. You either have to replace them all, or you're going to have an imbalance system, and it's just it turns into a bigger mess. We don't know how long nickel, iron, alkaline batteries last because 100-year-old versions are still going strong, which means if you buy a new nickel, iron battery from a Hank and Steve your great-great-grandchildren in 100 years in the future, uh, assuming uh, no 30-caliber bullets go through these things, uh, would still be using them uh, and, and in perfectly good condition. Changing out the electrolyte, how frequently, Hank? If it's in a stationary application and you main, and the mineral oil is maintained at the top, it'll be 100 years before you'd ever need to change out the electrolyte. We aren't guessing about how long 
nickel iron batteries last. It's not guesswork, it's not speculation, because the there's nickel iron batteries that are 100 years old still going perfectly strong, aren't they? That's correct. Amazing, absolutely amazing. 